Hey. We're back. Three rows, farthest north. Copy. I will be up. You got a med kit? Okay. You go around the side? Who's good? Who's got a med kit with you? We gotta get her up. Are you bleeding? Are you hurt anywhere? A woman left a community in Ohio shocked and horrified when she stabbed a three-year-old boy to death in a random attack outside of a grocery store. And now months after the attack, another twist in the case, which would seemingly leave the toddler's family without closure for the time being. Let's go back to the beginning. 33-year-old Bianca Ellis has been behind bars since June for the deadly attack that left three-year-old Julian Wood dead and his mother injured. On June 3rd, the victims were leaving a Giant Eagle grocery store in North Olmsted, Ohio. Not knowing at the time they were being followed by Ellis, who allegedly followed them out to the parking lot and attacked them randomly before just walking away. Prior to the deadly attack, Ellis was seen in chilling surveillance video outside of a local thrift store after she stole two knives, one of which was allegedly used to stab three-year-old Julian and his mother. After leaving the store, investigators say she walked over to Giant Eagle with the knife in hand as she spotted on surveillance video from inside the store. It was inside the grocery store where Ellis reportedly spotted Julian and his mom before following them outside. Authorities say it was there in the parking lot Julian was stabbed in the face and back and his mother was stabbed in the shoulder, all within the span of seconds. On body cam video from that horrific day, officers and emergency crews are seen rushing over to the store with hopes to save the toddler's life. so, yeah. Good. All right. Is there a handle chest on it? Okay. Is your on the Let's go. Yes, all Wesley, guys. Get mom out. Go take her to a car right now. Hey, somebody go get mom. She doesn't you see this. Ready? Go. Right so you didn't see the actual yeah, crime? Yeah, see the actual crime. Okay. Very much. Okay. Okay. 
Shoppers were left visibly shocked and emotional. One of the witnesses recounted to officers the suspect not saying a word before viciously stabbing the victims. You okay? That sucks. It's not okay for anybody to see. All right. Name, address, date, her driver's license phone number. We'll take care of this. We want a little wife. We want to go back. Thank you. No, yeah, thank you. Ventress, just tell me what I need to do to help, buddy. You got any more quick work just in case? I emptied out my cruiser from stop before I ran over here. I didn't hear anything. I had my windows down. I didn't hear anything. All I heard okay. was just screaming, and the lady grabbed her child up out the cart, and that's when it fell over, and they collapsed over here, and the lady just continued to walk off, and that's when everybody just kind of came out of nowhere, yeah. and I, I got out, and one guy, he said, what happened? I said, I don't know. I'm going to go look. Um, I came about halfway, and I saw her trying to get away, so I hopped in the car and chased her down. Okay. Um, to almost where that, that white building is. Yeah. Um, that's when I called 911. And um, like literally 30 seconds later, you guys showed up. Okay. All right, cool. So the kid was in a car? In the car? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it was in the car and the car fell over? Yeah. It didn't take police long to find Ellis, who was found with the knife allegedly used in the horrific attack. Two eleven. I need a car to go help the kid. He's in the first couple aisles. Where's your cuffs? Get custody. Who's that cuffs? Slow down, slow down. Hold on. We're good. All right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Chad, you want me to go to the female or Chad Eagle? Go to the female. Go to the female. That female that you have. Hey. She's in the first okay. three rows, farthest north. Copy. I will be up. Okay. You got a med kit? Okay. Go around the side. You're good. Who's got a med kit with her? We gotta get her up. Alright, we have a female in custody. Are you bleeding? Are you hurt anywhere? Okay. Nice right there. Okay. 5217 ammo. Let's get her up. Here you go, man. Hold you up, okay? Grab your other arm. We're going to lift you up, okay? Yeah, we're stand up, okay? One, two, three, stand up. Stand up. Come on. In round. Marquis in round with the mic. All right, let's put her in the back. Hang on. I'm going to check her right here. Okay. Okay. You good with that? Yeah. Walk it back this way. 52 LL3, I got three units. 1719 myself. That's right, Eagle. In the parking lot, third aisle, if you got EMS coming. We don't have anything here for kids. Petro, out in the parking lot. We're out in the parking lot. Take a seat. 
Frank, crank up the AC for you, okay? We gotta get some tape ripped this off. Get any tape back here? Tape? Yeah. Police don't believe the victims had interacted with Ellis prior to the deadly stabbing. And it remains a mystery as to why she attacked the three-year-old and his mother. As officials say prior to the stabbing, she didn't have a history of violent offenses. Just months prior to the attack, body cam video showed her getting arrested in Florida for criminal trespassing at a hotel. Employees at the hotel called police to report her trying to rent a room, but didn't have any money. And when police arrived, Ellis told them she wanted to go to jail. What's your name? Bianca? What's going on tonight? I was wanting to get booked for trespassing. Why? Because I am. You have no reason? You just want to? I have no words to go. Okay, so I'm just going to go through the formality, right? So they want you to leave the property. They want you to, you know, leave, not come back. I'm trespassing you. You're being formally trespassed by the Osceola County Sheriff's Office. Okay. You need to leave the property now. But what about getting arrested? Are you refusing to leave the property? Yeah. Why? Because it's cold outside. I don't have nowhere else to go. So you're just refusing to leave the property? Because it's, yeah. You have no family, no nothing? No. I'm not from here. I was just vacationing. Osceola Patrol 89 to 36. Stand up. You guys going to take my stuff too? Turn around. Hands behind your back. What's going on with this stuff? This is weird. You got like cloth. Can you move your thumb out of the way? to get the fabric pinched in there. Alrighty. You have anything on you? Make your palms face each other. There you go. Anything on you I should be aware of? No drugs. No guns. No knives. Nothing. Would you be more comfortable with two cuffs? Huh? Okay. Now facing several charges, including aggravated murder, murder, attempted murder, felonious assault, tampering with evidence, and theft, it doesn't appear she'll be facing trial anytime soon. Ellis left Minnie in shock again when she appeared in court smiling at cameras despite the heinous allegations she faces. Then in another twist last week, a judge ruled she was incompetent to stand trial and has since been ordered to an inpatient treatment facility. Competency was first brought up during a July hearing when Ellis's attorney said she was incompetent and unable to assist in her defense. According to court records, Ellis was undergoing a 20-day evaluation when the doctor treating her said she was incompetent to stand trial, but said there is substantial probability of restoration to competency within the statutory time frame if provided with a course of treatment. I'm joined now by clinical and forensic psychologist, Dr. April Alexander. Thank you so much for being here. A woman in Ohio who is accused of stabbing to death a three-year-old child and also wounding the boy's mother in essentially a random attack outside of a grocery store back in June was found incompetent to stand trial. What is your reaction to that? Yeah, when I heard about the case back in June, I was really disturbed by it, uh, that this was a random act of violence that seemed pretty peculiar. Um, so I was already thinking about how could something like this happen? Is this a case where mental health had something um, to do with the actions? Now, based on the reports that are out right now, if you were kind of drawing a conclusion, what kind of diagnosis potentially would you be able to give Bianca Ellis? Well, there's a wide range of possibilities of diagnoses. When we see individuals who are incompetent to stay in trial, it could be anything from uh, cognitive disturbances to neurological disturbances to what we often see with individuals who are incompetent to stay in trial, a range of different psychotic spectrum disorders. So things like schizophrenia, delusional disorder, things that would uh, prompt the person to do something that is outside of the norm and then not be able to understand the facts of their case. Um, talk to me a little bit about un incompetency, what that means, and what type of evaluations defendants like Bianca Ellis have to undergo when they are found incompetent. So for the public to know, competency to stand trial is being raised in a lot of cases throughout the United States. Um, psychologists are seeing about 25 to 30,000 cases per year of incompetence to stand trial. 
What that means is there is some speculation of a mental health factor impacting a person's ability to engage with their attorney and also understand their case. We often um, describe this as rational or factional knowledge. So are you able to track what's going on in the courtroom? Are you able to understand the different pleas? Um, do you know how to conform your behavior to the courtroom? So am I going to be worried about you jumping up in the middle of a trial and disturbing um, the process? Or are you able to really consult with your uh, attorney in a way that can help protect you? Um, that with some individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, they might have delusions uh, related to their mental illness where they think their attorney is against them um, and they won't be able to support their case. So there's a wide range of different diagnoses that can come up and a wide range of reasons why a person might be incompetent within those domains. And what would have to happen for her to be found competent to stand trial? Absolutely. So most individuals end up going to either a uh, competency restoration program. In some states, those are housed in state hospitals uh, where they'll receive treatment, sometimes daily, um, in order to get some of that education on the facts of their case, make sure that they understand their rights. And then for others, that also includes medications. I think in this case, uh, one of the psychologists suggested that they might be in need of some medication which might reference, again, some mental health diagnosis that's impacting their ability to um, go to trial. And what do you make of it when people say the defendant, Bianca Ellis, doesn't deserve to go to a psych hospital for treatment? Instead, she should be punished with jail or prison right now. Well, that's one point of clarity that's really confusing for a lot of us when we're talking about competency to stand trial. Competency to stand trial is something that we want in order to protect the individual's rights. We all have a constitutional right to a fair trial, and that's what we're trying to protect. With most individuals who are found incompetent to stand trial, they are later found competent. Uh, this sometimes happens within, uh, again, some of these competency restoration programs, anywhere from 50 to 70 days on average. So it's not that they're avoiding punishment. It's that we just want to make sure that they, there's a fair trial process going on because we don't want anything to happen, uh, especially for the victim's families, for this to be reversed and have an appeals case. So most individuals who are found incompetent to stand trial do return to the case and those proceedings do go forward. And months prior to the stabbing, Bianca Ellis was actually arrested in Florida. And I'm bringing this point up mainly because authorities say that she doesn't have a history of violent crime. So when she was arrested in Florida, you know, we um, had body cam video from that um, incident where she was essentially asking the officers to send her to jail. She had no place else to go. So she wanted to go to jail. She was arrested for trespassing. What do you make of kind of that trajectory from nonviolent offenses to just brutally stabbing a three-year-old boy and his mother in a parking lot at a random attack. She didn't know the victims. This was, again, just brazen and random and in broad daylight. Yeah, this brings up a whole lot of issues. Again, when these tragedies happen, I often ask myself, why? What happened to this person? Um, so I have a lot of questions. Was Bianca homeless? Was Bianca homeless and uh, struggling with mental health conditions and couldn't seek help? Um, in a lot of these cases, we uh, see a lot of individuals who are not receiving mental health care until they end up in a jail setting, um, until something tragic happens. Um, so for me, I'm being curious about where some of the falls in our mental health system are occurring for people like Bianca so we don't have tragedies happening. For her to ask for, to be sent to jail in that situation, uh, she's asking for help um, and not in ways that we might ask for help, in ways that she thought could get her help. Um, you made a point earlier in our discussion about, you know, um, defendants not being a distraction when it comes to court proceedings. And after she was arrested for the stabbing of Julian Wood and his mother, that she was kind of smiling at cameras, laying her head on the table. Like, so there was kind of this different parallel, I would I would say that kind of this range of different emotions. Do you think that is kind of what initiated her to undergo these types of evaluations in addition to the fact that, again, she commit or allegedly committed this random and brazen crime? Absolutely. So I saw that footage myself. And that's the second where I said, ooh, something's going on there. Competency is going to be raised. So competency to stand trial evaluations are raised anytime we see something odd or peculiar in the courtroom. Anybody can raise it. It could be the attorney, the judge. And what that does is once we raise it, we automatically have to stop court proceedings. Um, and again, all of us thought that was odd, um, that maybe that's not because she's a psychopath and 
just not empathetic, that something else might be going on. And so that's why we want to initiate a competency to stand trial evaluation to rule out anything else and see if there is something um, happening with her mental health. And I know um, most of our discussion has been centered around Bianca Ellis and the incompetency, but as far as kind of the message it sends to the victim's family as they're awaiting this um, kind of going through this horrendous, horrific time in their lives, waiting for justice, wanting that to happen, but now her trial is being pushed. um, What are your thoughts on that as they kind of await for justice in this case? Yeah, I think this is the unfortunate aspect about sometimes the competency process, uh, because the other side of this is people have rights to a speedy trial. Um, So the victim and their family do want justice and they want explanations and justice now. And when we have things like competency happening, obviously that's going to delay the trial process. So this is a, a really challenging situation in our criminal justice system of trying to protect the rights of all. Um, Again, I think one of our calls to action is to figure out how we can create a better mental health system so we could have avoided this in the first place, the person could get the treatment that they need, and we don't have further victims. All right, Dr. April Alexander, I appreciate your time so much today. Before we sign you off, anything else about this case um, that you would like to add? No, again, I hope people can pay attention and have some calls to action for uh, different changes in legislation in their own states. All right. Thank you again so much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Bianca Ellis was ordered to undergo treatment at North Coast Behavioral Health. And once her treatment has been completed, she'll be placed back into the custody of the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office. The statutory time frame to determine if Ellis could be competent for a future trial is one year. Reporting for Law and Crime, I'm Elizabeth Milner.